So before I go into this message, let's ask, uh, rise and ask the Lord for his blessings here. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much again for a beautiful morning that we can come together by your grace. Lord Jesus, we can never be thankful enough for the grace that you allow us to have, the joys that we have, the, the, the things you give us. Lord, it's unbelievable, Lord Jesus, that you look upon us that way, and we're grateful. Help us all to be truly grateful and thankful for what you have done for us. And Lord, at this time, I lift up uh, Rick Platt to you, Lord Jesus. You will comfort him, Lord Jesus. That there's no words we can say to comfort him, but you can comfort his heart. Lift him up to you, Father, that you will bring joy to his heart. I know he'll grieve for a while, but you can still, behind there, put, give him peace, Lord Jesus. And the uh, Hebrews, you'll uh, protect them on their way back. You'll have your holy angels around their vehicle and around them. You'll give them peace and joy and you'll be with them, and you'll touch everyone here, Lord, that has shown up, Lord God, this morning. You will be with everyone, open their understanding, my understanding, my ability to bring forth what you have given me, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, my message is still part of what I had the last two weeks, which was uh, building upon that foundation, except from a little bit of a different vantage point but it still has a lot to do with that. And it's out of uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, uh, KJV, King James Version, verse 15. And we've had the scripture multiple times, but I'm going to expound on it, it in a little, little more detail, where it says to study yourself, yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All these are key. The study part to show that God approves of you. Study that, show yourself that God does approve of you once you're born again. And that you are a workman that needs not to be ashamed, but there is a catch to it. You have to rightly divide the word of truth to get that, those, those uh, precious uh, jewels that God has for us in his word. In uh, Ephesians 4:14. Also out of the King James Version, it says this, Be fully persuaded in your own mind of what you believe in that is the truth of God. It says in verse 14 that, that we will henceforth no, be no more children tossed to and fro and carried away with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men, cunning and, and cunning and craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So there are people like that who take the word of God and twist it to their own destruction. Like I was talking with Brother Tom yesterday about these guys who have this either podcast where they were saying if you eat pork, you're, you can't go to heaven. That is doctrines of devil and far, devils as far as I'm concerned. What God has cleansed, call, call you not unclean. That includes people and food you eat. You bless it and ask God to bless it and it will be sanctified. So if you cannot express yourself well, I'm going to go into a little bit the depth of this, of uh, studying to show yourself approved unto God. If you cannot express yourself well in each of your beliefs, work and study until you can. And, and the reason I'm saying this, if you, are, if you run into different people and you travel a little bit, and let's say you come here to church and all of a sudden you believe what we believe, and you run into somebody else that doesn't believe the way we believe, then you'll believe what they believe. It's very important that you study and find what the truth is and believe what the Bible says. I try to base what I believe in on Scripture, but it, it comes by revelation. There's something that, there's, there's a Scripture, I think it's in Titus or Timothy, where, where it says the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. So the, reading the Bible, there's lots of religions that read the Bible, but they read it from a point uh, from a, from a non-spiritual perspective where the spirit are not born again and they cannot, you're not qualified to inter interpret scripture then because the spirit of God has to give the interpretation. And the other thing is to know the heart of God, to know God. What does he mean? Uh, you can only, uh, if, if I write a, a, an autobiography of my life and my family, you will only know me through the 
autobiography, but if you would have lived with me and have known our, our family, you would know intimately what our family is about. So it is with God and the truths of God. You can know about God. The Bible is sort of an autobiography of, of uh, God and uh, Christ. But if you don't know him personally, it's just a storybook. It doesn't mean it has no depth. And we do know it has great depth. We can never, we'll, it'll take eternity to find the bottom of it. And then you might not even find it. But if you, if, uh, going back, if you cannot express yourself well in each of your beliefs, work and study until you can. If you don't, other people may miss out on the blessings that come from knowing the truth. So you're not only che cheating yourself out of being free in Christ, you're also keeping it from other people that you may be able to teach about these truths. Strive to re-express the truth of God to yourself clearly and understandably. And God will use that same explanation when you share it with someone else. So if you know crystal clear what the Word is saying, then you can, in return, expound in a way where other people will understand and they will clearly see if the Holy Spirit is there. Have you ever had the experience where you witness or minister to somebody and you're just, you feel the anointing, it's just you're, 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 the words coming out of your mouth are not your own, they're just flowing. It's because God is using the truth that you have taught yourself in the Word and He's bringing them out of your mouth to others in a way where they're just standing in awe and they've never heard it like that. I've, I've, I've experienced it over and over, especially at, at work, where I in, talk to individuals and all of a sudden the, the Holy Spirit just ministers through me to them by stuff that I say that, that it, it, you have to really experience it to believe it. But I know it happens because it has happened to me over and over again. But there's a step that you must take. You must step out and start ministering and then that happens. It doesn't happen before that. So try to state to yourself what you believe lines up and is the absolute truth of God's word, word, and you will be allowing God the opportunity to pass it on through you to someone else. That's the, the beauty of this. So always make it a practice to stir your own mind thoroughly, to think through what you have easily believed. Your position is not really yours until you make it yours through suffering and study. That is key here. Suffering part is very important because through suffering, and your suffering may vary from person to person, you're not always suffer the same things, but it solidifies what you believe in. It, it makes you go to scripture and it becomes part of you and you understand it through su suffering and study. The author or speaker from whom you learn the most is not the one who teaches you something you didn't know before but the one who helps you take the truth with, uh, with which you have quietly struggled, give it expression, and speak it clearly and boldly. This is, this is beautiful here. So again, the author or speaker from whom you learn the most is not the one who teaches you something you didn't know before, but the one who helps you take a truth which with you have quietly struggled and then give it expression and speak it clear and boldly. And, and then the other, again, I'll re, uh, repeat that, it's to get to know God and His truths uh, starts, uh, starts with asking. So there's a scripture, and I asked Brenda to put it up, it's in Matthew 7, 7. Jesus said, ask and it will be given to you. And we cannot, nothing can be given to us except we ask. We have to ask, starts with that. That's the, the simplicity of 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 becoming childlike, we ask God. Uh, but God cannot give until a man asks. He knows your need, he's God, he knows it, but you have to ask, ask. It's, it's, uh, it's asking is that admi admittance in your heart, your own heart, that you are lacking and you need whatever it is, let's say wisdom, ask God for wisdom. We need, if you lack wisdom, it says in James, then ask God, and if, and if you lack wisdom, then God will give you wisdom. So uh, it is not that he wants to withhold something from us, but that it is the plan he has established for the way of redemption. The whole plan of redemption is about asking. The whole world, the sins have been covered. Every sin that has been, ever, ever has, has been committed has been covered. But there is a catch to it. We have to ask for forgiveness. And so it, don't, that, it, it doesn't end there. It continues to whatever... As we grow, it, it comes by asking, by experience, by suffering, through suffering, through whatever God 
has put in your life to allow you to grow in his word. So through our asking, God puts his process in motion, creating something in us that was non-existent until we asked. The inner reality of redemption is that it creates all the time. That's the beauty of the redemption of Christ. It's a new life. New growth is like a, new ba- a, a, a newborn. Life begins and it grows and it grows. That's what the born-again experience did within us, the redemption of Christ. And as the redemption creates the life of God in us, it also creates the things which belong to that life. So it creates more that pertains to this, this spiritual life in growth, unless you're going to be satisfied with a, with a bottle for the rest of your life and on milk. But it should have be created within you a deeper desire to know the Word of God and to go deep into the things of God and to spend time with God. See, uh, Christianity isn't just about reading the Bible, even though it is about reading the Bible. It's not about uh, singing songs, even though it's a good part of Christianity. The biggest and the best part about Christianity is having that one-on-one relationship with him and then with the rest of the body of Christ. That's what uh, brings forth growth in your life and understanding. In John uh, 13, verse 32, Jesus said, If I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people unto me, or all men unto me. So this is the whole, uh, the the, the gist of the whole story, what I'm getting at is, is to study and make sure you know clearly what God has shown you to the point where you are able to tell others as clearly as you see it in that clarity. But still, do not forget, it's God that gives the increase. He opens minds. He draws people. Uh, as clearly as we can make and preach the gospel, that doesn't mean people will understand. But this is pertaining to already saved people. If you want to grow in Christ and know more, then the ability to clarify what you mean becomes very important, where it's the preaching of the cross when it comes to preaching the gospel that is the power and has the power to change people's lives. So we can do nothing to convince a person that is not saved, but we can surely, in clarity, bring things forth to other believers and make our, our, our view of how the Holy Spirit has shown us what Scripture means very clear uh, to others, as clear as it is uh, to us. And in closing here, I have some uh, more wisdom from Oswald Chambers here. He says here, there is no allowance whatever in the New Testament for the man who says he's saved by grace but does not produce the graceful goods. Jesus Christ, by his redemption, can make our actual life in keeping with our religious uh, professions. And what are our religious professions? That we are redeemed. We are part of Christ. And let those fruits that the Bible talks about be evident in our lives. Praise the name Amen. of Jesus. Good message, Brother James. You know, next week is Christmas already. It's amazing. Time is flying. Almost seems that we just had Christmas. But you know, it seems to me, as the words of Jesus said, except those days be shortened, they'll be shortened for my elect's sake. It almost seems that's a prophecy. What Jesus predicted. God is shortening the days. Time is flying. It's passing by like you have never noticed. You go to work, and you have to be home and go to sleep again. And all of a sudden you notice there's a month passed, another month has passed, you don't even know what's going on. But you know you've got to remember, being in Christ is so much better. And today, this morning, I, uh, I have a different message who is in charge? People have asked, are we in the tribulation already? The devil will want you to believe that. He's playing his cards with all the COVID that we had to go through. People figured, ah, it must be the end. Sure, it's the end times, but it's not the tribulation yet. And there's a fine line when it comes to the word of God about the tribulation, when it will start, how it will start, and who will start it. It will not be the devil, trust me. And it will not be our world leaders either. They will be destroyed. And the one that withholds and the one that is in charge of the tribulation and all other things is nobody else but Jesus. 
One thing we have to remember when it comes to the Word of God, he pointed out very, very clear who's in charge. The church belongs to Jesus. The world is a, a, the world belongs to the devil. That is the devil's game. And God is going to deal with them through the tribulation. But the church will not go through the tribulation. When will the tribulation start? There is rumors, there's wars, there's all sorts of things that we have to go through. When Paul the Apostle writes to the, set, to the Thessalonians, he writes, put it up there, in Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 2, he reminds the church, he said, now listen to you guys, listen to me. And you know what withhold that he might be revealed in this time? He's talking about the tribulation, about the Antichrist. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. And we can see it all around us. Iniquity, governments are going haywired, all with their lies. It's around the corner. People, people are failing. Their hearts are failing for fear of what's coming. But the real truth of this is not yet. Because while the church is here on this world, nothing can happen much. Because we are the salt of this earth, we're holding back the evil. The Christian is not being destroyed. The unbeliever is not being destroyed because we are their protection here upon this earth. Always remember to live a life that is pleasing to the Lord Jesus Christ. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now let it will let until it be taken out of the way. That's when all hell will break loose. Trust me. When God comes and gathers and makes the final point and says, Listen, children, time is up. It's closing time. Time for me to bring you home and let my father do his work with this unbelieving world. And always remember, when it comes through the tribulation, don't ever think the devil will not be affected, the Antichrist. He will be totally and completely destroyed like anybody else. The tribulation and all the judgments that God is going to pour out upon this world will be against all evil, including the devil. This is not going to be a picnic. Anyone that thinks he can go through the tribulation and live, you have another, there is another guest coming for that one. Because the tribulation is a place of torment and torture where God is going to pour out his wrath upon this unbelieving world that rejected his son Jesus Christ who died on the cross for him, for you and for me. When we go into Revelations, in Revelations 4.1, when Jesus said, come up here, talking to his church, I will show that I will show you the things which must be hereafter. Nothing can happen while the church is here on this earth. We are here to preach the gospel, to warn this world about the wrath of God that is to come. We're here to preach the word of God for the unbeliever so that they may come to repentance because God is not willing that any should perish but all should come to repentance. And that's what your, what your job is. That's what my job is, is to tell people, guys, yeah, you need to escape. There is hell coming. There is a lake of fire ahead of you. There is a warning sign. There's a road closed up there. It's a big hole. And if you go, walk, go on that road and travel on that road, you will be totally and completely and annihilated. You will be destroyed forever. That's why we're here to preach this great gospel. That's why we celebrate Christmas as the birth of Jesus to come down to save mankind from their sins. That's why we cannot let go. We cannot compromise. Tell them the truth. Jesus is the only way to heaven, to the Father. Jesus is your only forgiveness. He's your only cleansing. He is your only God. There is no other salvation given among men whereby we must be saved. And we have to remember when Jesus gave you the command, he said, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. He's talking about saying God the Father gave him the authority over everything, over the devil, over sin, because he conquered that at the cross of Calvary for us. And he has given that commission to his church. 
Go and preach the gospel. Cast out devils, heal the sick. And when in Revelation, that's why it's so important to get to know Jesus now, to turn to him for salvation, because the tribulation is coming. It's around the corner. And it will one day, for some, it will be too late. If you do not heed and take warning to turn to Jesus for salvation. In Revelations chapter 5, in verse 1, when Jesus was introduced, and those that don't believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, those three are three are one, they agree in one, you will find out there is a difference. God is on his throne, and there is Jesus. There is not just one God, there is three gods, but they are agreeing one. So it says, for, for, and I saw in the right hand of him, it's when the tribulation will start. That's when God takes his church home, and then the tribulation will be put into action. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. It's a book that is sealed. No devil or human being can start the tribulation. There is no way because Jesus holds everything in his hand because we cannot start it. The devil cannot start it. It's Jesus and Jesus alone that will call the shots. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy, and who is worthy to open the book? Let me hear and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof? He proclaimed it because no man, not even me or you, no human being, not even God the Father. And I tell you why. It's Jesus that went to the cross for us. He's the one that conquered death. He's the one that conquered sin. That's why he's worthy. It says, who is worthy? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much. There must have been going to be a, a, a heartbreaking for, for, for the church. But there is always somebody there to do it. Neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. That's how horrible what written in this book about the judgments of God was to come when God releases and opens it through Jesus Christ. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, had prevailed to open the book and to lose the seven seals thereof. Praise the name of Jesus. He is the one that is worthy. He is the one that conquered everything. And he is the one that is able, only one that can open the seals. And he is the one that will start the tribulation and nobody else. Until God, Jesus says, it's time to pull the plug. It will not happen because nothing will happen until the very last soul that is to be saved upon this earth, when God takes his church home, that's when Jesus will pull the plug. God the Father will tell it to Jesus, here's the book, open it and start it. I will read it again. And one of the elders said unto me, weep not, Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, had prevailed prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And he took, and he came and took the book out of what? Out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. There is God, and there is God the Father, there is God the Son. There is two. Anyone telling you otherwise, there is, Jesus has only raised himself up, there is no God, there is no Father, doesn't know what he's talking about. There is God the Father, there's God the Son, there's God the Holy Ghost. That's what we are. We are one with him. When you turn to Jesus, you turn to Jesus for salvation, you become one with that tri with the Trinity. It's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit in his church. We are connected. There is one spirit. We are all saved by one spirit. It's the spirit of Jesus. You cannot separate that. Young people, if you're listening to me, don't make a stupid mistake by not turning to Jesus. Don't push it off. Tomorrow might be too late. 
Tomorrow might be your end. There's so many, many, many kids dying. I remember years ago, I listened to a funeral director. They had a young guy. It was about 20 years ago. I was working at WS that time. And there was this young guy full of the devil, full of drugs. And he proclaimed, not even God can kill me. The tragic of this one, he went down on Main Street at a hundred and some miles per hour, and he lost control, and he ran into a flag, into a pole. Then into flames, he screamed out. Everybody around him heard the squeak. It was horrible. They heard him scream. Listen to me, this is no joke. Hell is no joke. If you don't turn to Jesus now, tomorrow might be late. Don't mock God. Don't push it aside because Jesus is crying out to you because he knows. Hell is for real. The eternal lake of fire is for real. And that young guy, only God knows. Personally, I think he went to hell. It's horrible. Nothing else can happen like that. You do not mock God. Don't even try to challenge God because he will slap you. So turn to him for salvation. He's your only hope. He's your only way into heaven. There is no other way. So please, as we celebrate and come around the Christmas season, think of one thing. Jesus came to this old wicked world to save those that are lost. He didn't come to save the righteous, the self-righteous person. He came to save the sinner that sees his sin, that sees that he needs to be saved, he needs to be born again, he needs to turn to that one only salvation that he has given us, and that is Jesus. So the Lord bless you and make you a blessing richly, and the Lord love you. Thank you.